The following recording is a presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Rohnert Park, California, and of Pastor Val Mark Smith. We are an independent Baptist congregation committed to the accurate presentation of the historical doctrines of the faith. We welcome you to visit our services anytime here in the Rohnert Park area. Let's take our Bibles now, and if you would, and we turn to the book of Exodus chapter 13. Uh, today in our study of God's Word, we back up four months uh, to the middle of February. February the 13th is when we last left off with our study of the Christ of the Covenant. We paused the series on that date, of course, due to my back surgery and the long recovery. And I decided not to come back to uh, this subject in early May when I returned because of these changes that were, were happening in the church, uh, uh, what's happened in the last couple of weeks. And I felt that the Lord was leading me in a different direction to speak on some topics that I, I thought would be helpful during that time. Upon my return, I preached uh, the sermon entitled, Remembrances. And that sermon was about how the Lord led me to Berean. And the purpose of the sermon was to show that God leads us on different paths in the sojourn of our Christian life. Uh, we can't foresee where those paths will ultimately lead, but we trust that God knows best. Uh, we do believe that He will lead us. He will fulfill His purposes and we hope that we, as we pray and try to learn what the purposes of God are, that we don't seek our own will, but we seek the Lord's will. And I thought that was important for me to talk about that because of so many people heading to other parts of the, of the country. You just, you just don't know what's going to happen next. The Lord doesn't reveal that future to us. And then after we, I finished that sermon, I took up several more that had to do with worry and anxiety. And I also believe that I was led by the Spirit into those sermons because uh, they helped me probably more than they did anyone else. I needed them. I needed to study that subject because of what would, what would happen. And I tend to worries, anxieties, just like the next person does. That's a fact of, of humanity, of our lives. And so I needed those sermons. And I hope that they were helpful to you as well. And I want to reemphasize that there is a future for our church. We don't know exactly how and where the Lord will lead us, but I am confident in Him that we need not worry about the outcome because worry doesn't help anything. It doesn't change anything. Instead, we are to do what the Word of God says. We are to be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And as long as we are, the Lord will lead us where he wants us to go. And I remind you also that the path is very difficult at times. It, it may not be the way that we prefer to go. But we trust God for the process because it is his church, not ours. And we need to stay within the framework of what he commands in his word. And that's all that we can do. And God must handle the rest. Now today then we go back to our series of God's covenant in Christ and it is fitting I think that we come to it today. Uh, the timing is right because we've arrived at a part of Christ's covenant that involves the Holy Spirit and his leadership of Israel in the Old Testament. Although the focus of scripture is always our Lord Jesus Christ, we must remember that the Father and the Spirit are not out of the picture. In tabernacle worship, the Father and the Spirit uh, place the emphasis on Christ, uh, the great work that He would do when He would become incarnate and go to the cross to die for our sins. Under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, Israel was given these signs and figures of Christ, and uh, the Holy Spirit led those people just as he does Christians today, and just as it was in those days, they looked towards the saving work of Christ that would come through their sacrifices, so we need the Holy Spirit, and we have him because of the saving work of Jesus Christ. Now this study, uh, Christ of the Covenant, shows the marvelous ways that God revealed Christ hundreds of years before he came into the world. He is the eternal God. He makes himself known, not only through his creation, but also through the special revelation of his word. 
Now I want you to look at the end of chapter 13. I'm going to begin reading at verse number 17. And our text verses are verses 20 through 22. This is Israel immediately after they've been freed from slavery in Egypt. They know where they are to go because God gave a promise. He gave a promise to Abraham that he would inherit a land. So they were on their way to Canaan, the the place that God promised, but they weren't free to choose the route that they would travel. The shortest route was not the safest way, but God did intend to protect his people and to bring them safely into the land. And so God marked the path for them to follow. And this is typical of the way that God leads us today. In the 17th verse of Exodus chapter 13, And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And they took their journey from Succoth, and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to lead them or to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Much time has passed since the last message that we had on the Christ of the covenant. Uh, There's much information that we spoke about in those messages, just far too much for me to review. And so I'm going to leave that to you if you feel like you need to catch up somewhat on what those messages were and how we arrive at this point, then I would encourage you to listen to recordings. So we're not going to go back over old material. Instead, we arrive at the final subject, which will take us a couple of weeks to get through, uh, this, of this critical part of the Old Testament, that the tabernacle established the centuries-long worship of Jehovah God. And in our study of it, we, we viewed all of it, all of the worship of the tabernacle was part of God's eternal covenant that was made uh, between the persons of the Godhead and then the working out of that covenant in the lives that God chose for salvation. Now we transition from those last messages that we had. Those were on the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God in the Shekinah glory above the mercy seat. We transition from that into another visualization of God's presence. This was another blessing for Israel because God gave them a sign of assurance that he was always with them. And this ever-present sign was a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. And these showed that God would protect them, that God was with them wherever they were. He would lead them and he would never forsake them. They were always prone to doubts and fears. They weren't unlike us, and so that was the need for me to discuss those last few weeks about uh, fears and anxieties, about doubts. Israel's tendency was to be faithless and unbelieving. Even after they saw the great miracles that God did in Egypt, uh, and and even after they saw the, the wonderful supernatural works that he did during the wilderness wanderings, they still had doubts. They still fell at times, and didn't do what God wanted them to do. Now, in this text, in Exodus chapter 13, the last plague had happened to Egypt. That was the plague of the death of the firstborn. And it had devastated the Egyptians. Now, if you want to go back to chapter 12 and look at verse number 29, it says, And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house 
where there was not one dead. This truly was a disastrous plague. It was the last blow that convinced Pharaoh that he could no longer stand in the face of Israel's God. His people were beaten down, and they were ready for Israel to get out. In fact, they were insistent that the Israelites should leave. In the 33rd verse of that 12th chapter, and the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we be all dead men. Egypt was so anxious to get Israel out that God said, they will give you whatever you ask just to get rid of you. The Bible says, in a measure, I suppose, that God gave favor with the Egyptians for the Israelites, and so they did lend them all that they required. And thus, Israel spoiled Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And you may remember that the gathering of those spoils that they took from Egypt and left with, those were the things that were used to build the exquisite furnishings of this place where they worship God, the tabernacle. Now just before the Exodus, Israel celebrated the Passover, and this was a, a memorial that they were to keep throughout their generations, and still, of course, today we find the Jews celebrate Passover, and it was a perpetual um, memorial of this great deliverance that they had from Egypt. They ate the Passover lamb, the Bible says, with their traveling clothes on. They were fully prepared to leave. They had their shoes on their feet, their staff in their hand. And they were in a hurry because it was time to get out. And they were going out. And they were going to get out before anything could change. Anything Pharaoh could change his mind. And so Israel left Egypt. And appearing before them as they left was this great cloud that led them in the way that they should go. They followed the cloud, and soon they found themselves at the Red Sea, and there was no way to cross. Now, prompted by the work of the sovereign God, Pharaoh changed his mind. And the Egyptians, in an act of madness, convinced themselves that they had made a mistake in letting their labor force go free. And so Pharaoh gathered up his army and he began a hot pursuit and he cornered Israel against the sea and he blocked the way of their retreat. And I'm sure that it was Pharaoh's intention to kill enough of the Israelites that they would never ever think again of following a prophet like Moses. Now you have your Bibles open. If you look in the 14th chapter, you see what God did. And it involves the cloud and fire by which he protected his people. Exodus 14 and verse number 19. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, that is to Israel, so that the one came not near the other all the night. Now during that night, God was preparing his people to cross the sea. And while that was happening, Pharaoh's army was held at bay. The cloud was between them and Israel. And it's amazing that after seeing this and God holding Pharaoh's army back, that Pharaoh didn't retreat. I mean, that would have been the sensible things to do. But that was, this whole thing is in God's providence. And Pharaoh's mind is just under the control of God. And the Word of God says that God raised Pharaoh to display his power in his destruction. Paul explained in Romans chapter 9 that the whole world would know Israel's God before he was through with Pharaoh. And so after the last Israelite had cleared out from trekking across the bottom of the Red Sea and they were safely on the other side, that cloud lifted, the fire stopped, and Pharaoh was free to pursue to his heart's content. And so his army rushed into the sea in hot pursuit. But as soon as they got into the seabed, the path became mud. And God took off the wheels of the chariots. And there was this massive traffic jam in the middle of the Red Sea. They couldn't go forward or backwards. And then God told Moses to stretch out his hands over the sea. And God brought down the walls of water that were on each side. And the Egyptians struggled to escape. But the crashing waves fell on them, and it was too much. Israel was safely on the other side. And in the morning, 
the dead bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the beaches. In Exodus 14.31, the result is recorded. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. And you go on reading in Exodus, you come to the 15th chapter, and in the style of the folk singing of Peter, Paul, and Mary, which uh, I realize is a very dated reference, uh, Moses wrote a folk song about their great deliverance. And this was a song that charted for 15 centuries with Israel. They kept singing it all the way through and keep, they kept reminding each other of what God did to Pharaoh. And thus began Israel's journey across the wilderness to reach the promised land. And each step of the way was led by a pillar of cloud in the day and a pillar of fire at night. In our text verses 21 and 22 of Exodus 13, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. I want to emphasize that for Israel, the cloud was their special symbol that the Lord was with them. From the first time that the cloud appeared on the other side of the Red Sea until the tabernacle was raised in the wilderness and for 40 years until they reached the promised land, this cloud was a symbol of God's enduring presence. Now, of course, we know that there was a greater symbol uh, in the tabernacle. This was in the Holy of Holies behind the veil. There is where the Ark of the Covenant was with its mercy seat and the two cherubim that stood on either side of the mercy seat. And between those two cherub, cherubims were this brilliant light of God's glory. Now, that was the greatest sign that Israel had. But the only problem is the Israelites didn't get to see that. The only person who did was the high priest. And he saw it on only one day of the year. And he would go in on that day, and I'm sure that he would come back out with a report, yes, that light is still there, God is with us, and he just kept telling them over and over, God is with us, but they couldn't see it. The, the, the common people couldn't see it. That light stayed there for many, many centuries until later the glory of God departed. But the common people did not have this visual confirmation of God's presence. Instead, what the camp of Israel do is they would camp around the tabernacle and they could see this tall column of smoke or a cloud arising from the rear of the tabernacle just above the Holy of Holies. Now, in, in this next picture, you can see what Israel saw in their encampment. If we could put that picture up, I hope I did that. Yeah, you see the cloud coming up from the back of the tabernacle. And this is what Israel would typically see as they, as they camped there. And then at night, of course, that cloud would turn to a pillar of fire. So they would watch this transformation take place every day. The fire at night would light up the entire area. And this let them know that even though they were in the desert, they weren't deserted. God was always with them. Now, this cloud that God gave is not unlike... The many articles of furniture that are in the tabernacle, it's not unlike the coverings and the boards and the lampstand and the altars and the tables and the curtains. All of these things that God gave in the tabernacle were symbols. They were representations to tell them something about the God they served. They were types and figures. They were shadows of the great God that they served. And likewise, this cloud that God gave has some New Testament implications. It speaks to us of the ever-abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, you're used to hearing me say that the tabernacle shows us pictures of Christ. I mean, that's what the entire study was about, the Christ of the covenant. All of it speaks of Christ. Well, how then does this show us a picture of Christ? I mean, if this cloud symbolizes the Holy Spirit, how does that show us Jesus Christ? Well, in the many aspects of the tabernacle... I have constantly explained that each piece of furnishing, each covering the tent, every sacrifice, every, every, all the clothing, all the rituals speak in some way of Christ. Now today, speaking on the covenant of Christ, that's still our subject, only now we speak of Christ in the person of the Holy Spirit. God is a trinity. He is Father, Son, 
and Holy Spirit. We can't fully explain this. Matter of fact, we can hardly explain any of it. But we do understand from the scriptures that the Father is in the Son. The Son is in the Father. The Spirit is in both the Father and the Son. And the Father and the Son are in the Spirit. And yet the Father is not the Son. And the Son is not the Father. And the Holy Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son. And they are not the Spirit. All are distinct and inseparable, and yet they are one in essence. They are one, and they are fully God. And if you can explain what I've just said, then you can do what no one else in the rest of the history of the world has been able to explain. We just believe it because God's Word teaches it. Now, the Scriptures use the term Holy Spirit for what we commonly call the third person of the Godhead. Now, that doesn't mean that he's third in power and authority. It's just that the usual way that we say this is the Father first, God the Father. Then we say God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And that's the way you generally see the, the three persons of the Godhead ordered in the Scripture. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But that is not a ranking order. But rather, it teaches us that they are co-substantial in power and authority. Well, how is it then that we see a picture of Christ in the cloud while at the same time that we say the cloud represents the Holy Spirit? Well, we find an explanation in the New Testament. I want you to notice these two scriptures that help us to understand. In Romans 8 verse 9, it says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Well, that's a very interesting verse, isn't it? First there we see that spirit is mentioned individual, individually, and then he is called the Spirit of God, and then he is called the Spirit of Christ. Now, we, when we speak of God the Father and God the Son, we must understand that they are inseparably united to the Holy Spirit. Now, in speaking of salvation in Christ, this was also prophesied in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before Christ came. Now, you, you need several fingers today, so use all ten of your fingers today to keep them in scriptures. Keep your finger there in Exodus, because we will get back to it. We have several more scriptures to read. So now I want you to go to the New Testament book of 1 Peter. And here in 1 Peter, we, we see the equality of the Spirit and Christ, that though they are distinct, they are both God. And the Holy Spirit, of course, is the one who inspired the writing of the Bible. He inspired Peter to write this in 1 Peter 1, verse 10. He says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner time of time, listen, the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Now once again, this scripture shows us that the Spirit of Christ is the same as the Holy Spirit who was sent down from heaven. It was the Holy Spirit that inspired Old Testament prophets. They revealed Christ as the king who would establish a kingdom over the entire world. Now, in the tabernacle, we learn how Christ and the Holy Spirit work as one to fulfill the eternal plan of God in us. Remember, there is a covenant of redemption that is from before the creation of the world, and the fulfillment of that covenant is, is the scope of the entire Bible. This is why God gave us the Bible, to explain how this will all work out with uh, the creation of man and all these things, how that figures into this great covenant that God made between the Godhead. That's the scope of the Bible. And it is also the purpose that is arrived at in the types and figures of the Old Testament. These aren't just arbitrary things that are thrown out there for just read about and wonder about. No, these are things that teach us about Jesus Christ. So in every part of this, we understand, or we must understand, each revelation is about the sovereign God who works all things according to his purposes. 
The goal of God's plan is his glory. And he never puts anything into motion, nor does he sustain any act that will not bring glory to him. And this gives us confidence in the scriptures that we read, such as Ephesians 1.11 and Romans 8.28. These are the basis for them. In whom also, Ephesians 1.11, in whom, that is Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. And then the more familiar verse of Romans 8.28 that everybody quotes, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Why do all these things work out for good. It does because we are predestined to God's purposes. And that purpose is his glory, so it must work out for his good, our good. It must be the best thing that can happen. So without this, without us taking another doctrinal journey into the sovereignty of God, it should be evident to anyone who takes time to study the Bible that God's eternal purposes cannot be dependent upon things that we do. God is not dependent on us in any way. These are all things that are designed by God. He designed them to happen before he created this world. Now those are great talking points and we bring them up often, but that is not the primary subject today. So we go back to the primary uh, context of the pillar of the cloud and the wonderful benefit that it provided for the children of Israel. As we look at the scriptures and make this point known to you that this cloud represents the Holy Spirit, we don't know how much Israel understood about the Trinity. Now certainly we know that Moses taught it to them because it is found in the writings of the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch, of course, first five books of the Bible written by Moses, and they reveal the Trinity. Whatever they understood, when they saw the cloud, they knew that the Father was with them. They knew the Son was with them. They knew that the Holy Spirit was with them. Now, we would say surely they know this because Israel worshipped no idols. And none of them had ever seen God face to face. God is a spirit. And the way that they were commanded to worship God was to worship him as a spirit. Now, God gave them the cloud, and that must have been an astounding sight and a marvelous feeling to know that the God they worshipped overshadowed them, that he moved with them. And if you think about this, you know anything at all about the ancient cultures and gods that they worshipped, no one had ever experienced anything like this before. The prophet Jeremiah wrote of the insanity of those who worship idols. He said they make their idols with their own hands, they carve them carve the idol out of wood or they sculpt them out of stone. They fashion it and they fasten it to a pedestal with nails and they pick it up and they move it where they want it, even moving it into a temple that they build for it. And there it stays, it never moves, and it never does anything. Israel did not have an idol. What they have instead is the presence of a living God that is manifested in this cloud that goes before them. Their God moved. Their God advanced. Their God was active in any place that he chose to go. And their God was untouched by human hands because he doesn't need anything from anybody. He certainly, surely doesn't need anyone to carry him around. So this pillar of cloud served many purposes, not the least of which was to show Israel that their trust in God was not misplaced. They trust in the living God. Their God is alive. Their God does move. They can see the power of God working. And they know that he's there. Well, what are the purposes of the cloud? I'd like to take our study in that direction. I want us to learn about the cloud that led Israel and how it is a symbol of the Holy Spirit's presence. Now, in the time that's remaining, this has been one great big long introduction, so in the time remaining, I can only lead you through just a part of my first observation today. And here it is. The first is the cloud was God's gift. It was God's gift. No one had ever seen such a clear demonstration of God's presence. Israel was not yet a nation with laws. God would give that to them on Mount Sinai. They, they heard and they relied 
up until the time that God gave them the law, they heard and they relied on promises. Things that they had been told, promises made hundreds of years before. God gave Abraham the promise of the possession of Canaan. That was 400 years before these Israelites' time. And then in the intervening time, from Abraham until the children of Israel, there were acts of God's providence that showed that he was present. But the Israelites, at the time that we're reading here in the scriptures, are evidently or apparently without much recognition of God. For many years they lived that way. They lived among the Egyptians and it was their gods that were always surrounding them. And it was not until the taskmasters in Egypt cruelly afflicted them did they begin to cry out to their God. In Exodus chapter 3, God spoke to Moses in the burning bush and God said, I have heard the cry of my people. Now in that story in, uh, of the burning bush in Exodus 3, there we learn that Moses didn't know God's name. And Moses didn't think, well, I can't go to the people of Israel and talk to them about God if I don't know what God I'm talking about. What is, what is your name? So he asked God what his name was. The Israelites didn't know God's name, what he, what he is known by. I think that we would be able to say that there is some sort of worship of the one true God. There must be because these are God's chosen people. The heads of families, before there was a priesthood given, the heads of families would serve as priests and they would make the sacrifices. But the one thing that they were lacking was this close personal contact with God so they could feel that God's presence was surrounding them. I think that this is probably what led to their doubts uh, uh, when they saw the plagues and they saw that Moses' efforts had only done one thing, made their lives more miserable. He, his, his efforts to free them just made things harder on them. Now, they escaped the immediate effect of the plagues, but they didn't escape the wrath of Pharaoh. So Pharaoh sees all of this going on, and he says, well, here's the problem. You people are idle. The reason that you want to go out to worship your gods is because you don't have enough to do. And so he, he told the taskmasters that, well, these people need to go out and gather their own straw for making bricks, and the tally of bricks is not to diminish. So what Israel sees through Moses' efforts is things are getting worse. And they get angry with Moses. And the reason is they didn't have this relationship with God. They couldn't tell that Moses was acting on their behalf. They couldn't believe that the outcome of these plagues would yield God's intention that Israel would be set free. So what did they need? They hadn't seen the burning bush. God didn't appear to the Israelites in general in burning bushes. They didn't personally speak with God as Moses did. In fact, when Moses was up on the mountain talking with God, they heard the thunder, they saw the lightning, and they felt the earthquakes, and they were afraid to talk with God. They begged Moses to intercede for them. We see this in Exodus 20, verses 18 and 19. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us and we will hear, but not let God speak with us lest we die. They're just afraid of God. Now this cloud was God's gift to show them that he was there. The cloud delivered them at the sea to show that God was more powerful than the earth's greatest empire. They could never escape Egypt. Never could they do this on their own. But their God could make it happen. And remember, we read a moment ago that the cloud didn't take them the short route that would lead them through Philistia. That was a way of war. Going that way, they would be attacked. That was a way of fear. Instead, God decided to take them the hardest way, the one that went through the depths of the Red Sea in a place where it would be impossible to cross. And he wanted to show them what he would do with Pharaoh, and what he did with Pharaoh is an indication that God can protect them from all enemies. And so this cloud then becomes to them a gift of assurance. It's a guarantee of God's sovereign power. They could trust him to get them there because he is greater than all the gods that they would face, the ones that can't move, can't see, that can't lift a finger to help anyone. Now these, these then are the cold, hard facts of the case that we get right on the surface of the story. 
But what going, what's going on underneath? What is beneath all this and the types and figures of the great God that they served? How, how will they take this and apply it to generations that come afterwards so that they learn the lessons of the experiences of the children of Israel from the past? Well, let's back up just a bit to see what's going on underneath that leads us into New Testament truth. So we'll look at this first, the cloud after the Passover. The last plague on Egypt was the death of the firstborn. The firstborn children of Israel were saved because God promised that he would pass over them. But before he would, a sacrifice must be made. A lamb must be sacrificed. And then the blood of that lamb had to be smeared on the doorpost, uh, on the lintel or the beam across the top of the house. And when the death angel came during the night, he would see this blood on the door and he would pass over that house and he would go to the next house. And the death angel would do that with each house and each house with blood he passed over. But if there was no blood, then the death angel would stop. And however God made this happen, the angel would enter the house and he would sort through all the people that are on the inside he would sort through the children and the adults, and then the angel would choose the firstborn, and the firstborn was killed. There was not a house among the Egyptians where one was not dead. And the blood that was on the door was a symbol that an atoning sacrifice was made. Blood was shed, and no death of the firstborn showed that the people in the house had faith that the sacrifice would protect them. They believed that they would be protected by the blood, and they were. But understand this, that it's not until a sacrifice was made and the blood applied that God would give the gift of the cloud. There was no gift for disobedient people. There was no cloud to lead anyone who isn't saved under the blood. So this must be, they must be obedient to the command to have God's mercy extended to them. So I mean what they must do, they must act by faith to believe that the blood was their protection. There was no cloud for the Egyptians. When they went out in hot pursuit of Israel, the cloud didn't comfort them. It wasn't a gift for them. Instead, this is what we read in the 14th chapter, verse 24. It came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels, and they drave them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And you see this? That, that, that pillar of fire in the cloud troubled the Egyptians. And here's something that we must let everyone know, that the acceptance of the blood, or the rejection of the blood, has serious consequences for anyone who encounters God's commands. Now this is a beautiful foreshadowing then of the coming of the Holy Spirit. How do we make that connection? Well, next we look at the Holy Spirit after the cross. Israel's belief in deliverance by the blood is typical of the New Testament believers' faith in the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. The connection between Passover and Christ's sacrifice is seen in the institution of the Lord's Supper. Jesus said, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now we notice there that word testament. That's the same word as covenant. Moses used this in Exodus 24, 8. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant, or behold the blood of the testament which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. And then the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 linked the Lord's death and the Lord's supper with the Passover. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Now we, we can hardly miss these connections when we see leaven and unleavened, Passover and sacrifice. This is a marvelous link between all these things and the shedding of Christ's blood on the cross. Well, as Israel received no benefit of the cloud without first believing the promise made in the Passover, so no person receives the Holy Spirit into his life 
until he first places his faith in Jesus Christ. By faith, the lost sinner receives Christ or receives God's lamb. He believes the finished work of Christ is a sacrifice that was made for him. And based on that sacrifice, not for the sake of faith itself, but based on the reality of that sacrifice, the Holy Spirit comes to live in the life of the believer. And we could say it this way, that his indwelling of the believer is our cloud. This is the way that we are led. And when the Israelites saw the cloud, they knew that God was there, that all the promises that God made to deliver them from Egypt and take them to the promised land, all these promises are now in effect. God would make good on this promise that he gave to Abraham 400 years before. And we as believers today, we are promised that when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us, that God is at work in us to accomplish his eternal promise that he made in the past. That is before the entire world was created. The Abrahamic covenant was partially fulfilled with the possession of Canaan. And the covenant of redemption is fulfilled when God delivers us safely to his and our heavenly country. Now as the cloud was given to Israel as a guarantee of the future possession of the land, so the Holy Spirit is given to us as the guarantee of our future salvation. Now there's much that we could touch on here concerning this guarantee. Uh, it's one of the guarantees is that you can never lose your salvation. Once you've been saved, you've been given the Holy Spirit who is always with you. But let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1 for just a minute. And here in the book of Ephesians, we, we find two special verses about the Holy Spirit. I want you to see here. Ephesians says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. In Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, And whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. In the fourth chapter in verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And we should recognize that this seal of the Spirit is in fact a guarantee that as surely as we believe now, we shall be kept by faith through the power of God. Now I want you to go back to 1 Peter chapter 1 and let's understand what Peter said about the surety of our faith and how that can be applied to believing Old Testament Israelites. 1 Peter 1 beginning in verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein you greatly, greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now what we have in that passage is the language of surety. It's the language of absolute assurance that what God promises he never fails to do. Now notice in verse number 6, he speaks of manifold temptations. And in verse number 7, there is the trial of faith. Sometimes it doesn't look like we'll make it. Sometimes the way seems so impossible, and we failed and fallen so many times, we just will not make it. But we have the promise of God that not one believer... Not one believer in Jesus Christ will fail to make heaven. Now we look at the example of Old Testament Israel. They failed many times. You know their history. You know what it took for Moses to get them to the promised land. At times he threw up his hands and he just said, Lord, what am I to do? What, what am I to do with these people? 
In Romans 10, Paul wrote that Moses said that Israel would be provoked to jealousy by those who were never considered God's people. He quoted Isaiah. He said, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. This was a hard bunch to control. But you know what happens in the end? Here we read in Romans that Paul says, God has not cast away the people he foreknew. God will preserve believing Israel. So the cloud was a promise that Israel would get to the promised land. The cloud was a promise that although Israel would fail many times and they would grievously sin, their strength was not in them. Their strength to get to the promised land was not in their performance. Their strength was in God. God is the one who would take them. And the same is true of us. We receive the Holy Spirit and there are times that we truly do grieve Him. There are times that we don't act like we have very much faith. We falter, we stumble, we fail, we sin. And what does the Word of God say? Our steps are ordered by the Lord. It says, though we stumble, we'll not be utterly cast down. The Lord upholds us with His hand. Who does that? That's the Holy Spirit. So the psalmist says in Psalm 37, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And listen, there is no one who has received a gift like the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with us as a gracious act of a loving God. No one asked for him. No one thought of it before. Israel didn't ask for a cloud. But God knew that they needed assurance and he gave it. When Jesus was ready to be crucified, the disciples were fearful and they did desert him. But before, he'd given them a promise and he gave, said, you're going to receive a comforter. They didn't ask for this comforter. Instead, they wanted Jesus to stay with them. They didn't want him to go away. But Jesus said, I've got something better for you. I have something better. I will go away, but I will be in you. I will be in you. How would he be? Well, he promised the Holy Spirit would come and the Spirit would be the abiding presence of Christ. And then just listen to this. that brings us full circle. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. In Colossians 1.27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see that? Christ in you is the hope of glory. How is Christ in you? How is he? Who is the indwelling presence of Christ? The answer, of course, is the Holy Spirit. So this is your promise. And this is your hope of eternal life. Christ is in you, in the person of the Holy Spirit. That's a personal guarantee of every believer's glorification in heaven. 1 John 4.13 says, Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit. So this cloud is a marvelous truth. It symbolizes the very best that God could give his people. God is always with us in Christ. The Holy Spirit is always with us. And when I think of this in light of that last service that we had, we tend to fear for the future of our church. But I want you to remember just what we've seen here. Christ is with us. The Holy Spirit is with us. And His promise is He will never leave us or forsake us. So I can't look at you and say, well, I've got a plan here about how this is all going to happen. I can't tell you what's going to happen next week. I can't tell you next month. I can't tell you what will happen in the next year. If Christ tarries his coming, the path may very well become rough and steep for us here. Many more may fall out. There were some who will decide, well, I can't make that climb with you. Not up that insurmountable mountain. But regardless, Christ's in the Holy Spirit is still with us. Now that's comforting. It was comforting to the disciples in their troubled times, troubled times that they would face. It is comforting to us who can't see what the future holds. There's only one sure thing that we know about the future. We shall see God. We will be with God and we will live with Him forever. So I hope that that encourages you
to hold on to your faith. Trust in God. Trust in God. He's with you and he's with his church. Blessed be God for the Trinity. God the Father, Jesus Christ his Son, and the Holy Spirit who is his abiding presence. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to this presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Roner Park, California. If you would like further information about our church, please feel free to call us at area code 707-584-7275 or write to us at Berean Baptist Church, 6298 Country Club Drive, Roner Park, California, 94928. Additionally, you may visit us online at www.bebaptist.org.